everybody, Sherry Renner here with Law U America, and it is October 2014, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And in recognition, we have a video series where we're discussing legal abuse as an extension of domestic abuse. And in our first video, we defined legal abuse. And in this video, we have as our guest, Sandra Brown. Sandra Brown is CEO of the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction and Public Pathology Education. She holds a master's degree in counseling and is a program development specialist, lecturer, and community educator on pathological love relationships and domestic violence, and is an award-winning author. Her books include the award-winning Women Who Love Psychopaths and How to Spot a Dangerous Man Before You Get Involved. Sandra is recognized for her pioneering work on women's issues related to relational harm with personality disorder partners. Her full bio, as well as many articles and other resources, are available on her website, saferelationshipsmagazine.com, and we'll have a link to that website on our website, lawyouamerica.com. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, Sherry. So we're talking about legal abuse as an extension of domestic abuse. And uh, when you hear that, um, does anything come to mind with regard to what, what we're talking about, legal abuse? Um, yes, I mean, definitely legal abuse is an extension of domestic violence or domestic abuse, intimate partner um, violence. And it becomes a perfect platform for abusers to maintain contact, um, cause victims to emotionally disintegrate by um, having to go back through uh, the court system and face the very person who has harmed them in the past. Um, very triggering for people who have uh, trauma, um, traumatic reactions, post-traumatic stress, um, to have to keep going back through the court system over and, and over again, facing um, facing the person who did extreme damage to them. Okay, so when you say it's the perfect platform, you mean litigation and the, the courtroom itself? Um, yeah, absolutely. So there might be a you know a restraining order in place in which the partner can't have access to the victim, um, but by going to court over and over again, he can still have um, contact through the court system. And, um, you know, abusers, especially abusers who have personality disorders, look for places that they can strut their adversarialness. Um, their whole adversarialness. And so, you know, part of the disorders in personality disorder is, you know, that adversarial portion of it. So um, the courts become a perfectly legal uh, place to um, continue to have contact, um, to enjoy watching the victim decompensate, you know, right in front, in, in front of them. And so, um, and at the Institute, we have uh, clients who are on 60 uh, times in court and they're in family court and they're not even in custody and they have been in 60 times. And I, I think that's such you know, a great example uh, of um, legal abuse. I mean, using the court system to continue to maintain contact and be able to hurt someone. Okay, so if I hear you correctly, there are parallels that are playing out in, uh, in the, the courtroom in the context of litigation, parallels in, in how uh, a personality disorder or how domestic abuse is carried out, say in the relationship itself, and then in, as compared to what goes on in the courtroom as well. There are parallels and similarities. Well, absolutely, and, and that, uh, that's one way of really seeing um, a personality disorder at work because the personality disorder doesn't change simply because they go to court. In fact, it probably inflames it a little because they feel cocky and, you know, like uh, they've got uh, the court's eye and ear and can um, flaunt their stuff. And so, 
um, it, it is an extension. I mean, it's just, like I said, another platform, another um, way uh, for them to um, be the disordered person that they are. It's not, you know, there's not a big er an eraser where the person going into court is all of a sudden, you know, not disordered. They bring that disordered motivation to not resolve the conflict into, um, into court. Okay, so when we're talking about domestic abuse, we're not talking just about domestic violence, are we? Or physical violence? No, I, um, domestic abuse is, you know, um, harming someone emotionally, psychologically, physically, sexually, spiritually, financially. And so in a broader context, um, it is not just... Um, you know, physical assault. It can be um, uh, emotional and psychological and financial. And, you know, I think part of legal abuse is, you know, taking, taking someone back to court over and over again to hurt them financially. And that is just as much, um, you know, domestic abuse as physical assault. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you say, since, since you help women um, heal the aftermath of these abusive relationships, you also see them while they're um, still embroiled in these types of lawsuits and maybe you know, soon after um, they've been resolved, hope, hopefully they've been resolved. Um, and from your experience, do you see that domestic abusers have an advantage in the courtroom or um, or is the, does the courtroom become a more level playing field rather than, say, the living room? Um, I, I think they do have an advantage. I mean, with personality disorders, you have, you know, part, part of their, their personality makeup is this reduced conscience, remorse, reduced remorse, reduced guilt, um, and um, a lot of times they're very cool and calm in the face of um, things that would make other people anxious. So, you know, who looks more believable in court? This cool, calm, collected person with low conscience can lie, guilt, no remorse, or this hand-wringing victim who's anxiety-ridden and every time through court is increasing her, you know, post-traumatic stress-like symptoms. And so, oh, absolutely. I mean, if you're, you're, if you're looking at um, who presents just by visually looking at someone or hearing someone with more mental health issues, a judge would automatically think it was the victim who had more mental health problems when in reality she's just having a normal reaction to having been exposed to so much pathology you know in her relationship over the years okay so then the abusers seem to have the advantage in the courtroom um, so do you do you believe then from your experience that uh, that judges perhaps aren't quite as educated in the dynamics of personality pathology as they could or should be Oh, absolutely. I mean, part, part of what the Institute has done has been, you know, judicial training on that and understanding uh, the difference in abusers, which abusers can be helped and can change and which cannot and helping them understand personality disorders as a horrendous impact on the judicial system. Um, Bill Eddy uh, is a an attorney and social worker who has written a lot about personality disorders in court and how it clogs up the system and how it's adversarial and how the motivation behind that is not to resolve the problems, that the, the case itself becomes a form of entertainment for people who have personality disorders. And so um, his, his organization, High Conflict Institute, and you know, it's really been trying to focus on, on helping judges um, understand what personality disorders do to the process. Okay, I actually have a quote here from an article that Bill Eddy had written and posted on his website, 
which is www.billeddy.com, and that's B-I-L-L-E-D-D-Y.com, and I'll have a link to that published on the website as well. And his article is titled, How Personality Disorders Drive Family Court Litigation, and here's an excerpt. Family court is perfectly suited to the fantasies of someone with a personality disorder. There is an all-powerful person, the judge, who will punish or control the other spouse. The focus of the court process is perceived as fixing blame, and many with personality disorders are experts at blame. There is a professional ally who will champion their cause, meaning their attorney, or if no attorney, the judge. A case is properly prepared by gathering statements from allies family, friends, and professionals. Seeking to gain the allegiance of the children is automatic. They too are seen as either allies or enemies. A simple admonition will not stop this. Generally, those with personality disorders are highly skilled at and invested in the adversarial process. I think that pretty much tracks what you were saying, um, Sandra. Yeah, I, um, it, it is. And understanding that not everyone who goes to court is motivated to resolve the problem that um, and that that's very different from non pathological thinking. It's hard for normal people to believe that someone goes to court not to solve the problem, but to keep the problem going on. Um, you know, most people hate court. You know, they want to get in, get out, they'll, they'll give away, you know, a lot in order just to get that process done because they don't like it. But when you start seeing these cases, like the case I was talking about before, 60 times in court and you haven't even established custody, you know, that, that becomes what's called a high conflict case, which um, Bill Eddy has been writing about in terms of it normally being attached to at least one person who has a personality disorder and that the basic you know adversarialness of it is often an indicator because normal people want to get out of court and that the court needs more understanding about these high conflict cases and you know sometimes just the length of them or um, the language used in the pleadings or how thick the file is, is often an indicator that you have someone whose goal is entertainment, um, power and control, but not resolving the case. And we've been using the term personality disorder. Uh, what is a personality disorder? Um, it, it is a permanent um, way that the personality did or did not develop um, early on in early childhood. And the end result is this untreatable part of a person because you can't go back and get a redo on how your personality developed. And so it becomes a chronic pattern of behavior. And it, it impacts how they think, how they feel, how they relate to other people, and um, certainly how they behave. And so, again, to, you know, I, the, by the time they're in court, the person di getting divorced has obviously dealt with and felt the impact of that personality disorder, which is probably why they're getting divorced. They're very adversarial and difficult people, not just in court, but in general. Okay, and so there are, and there are different kinds of personality disorders, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there any certain type of personality disorder that is more prevalent uh, or shows up more frequently or expresses itself through legal abuse more than others? Well, I, I, there's certainly some that you probably uh, would see more in legal abuse um, just by the nature of the symptoms of that disorder. And that would be borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, um, and antisocial personality disorder. And then um, psychopaths, which are not technically a personality disorder, but sort of fall within that continuum. So those are really the court cloggers, as we call them, that, yeah, keep um, coming back and coming back or won't resolve. Okay, thanks. 
And I just had a question about the evidentiary abuse affidavit. Will you tell us about that? Um, yeah, that we abbreviate it and call it the EAA. It was created by one of the Institute's colleagues, Susan Murphy Milano. And she actually created it based on the Stacy Peterson case in which Drew Peterson's wife, Stacy, went missing. And um, it is a process that helps you document um, your case, including the abuse, and what is likely to happen to you um, in the context of that relationship. And it's used for prosecution in case you go missing are in a coma or are killed. And no one ever wants to think that their case is gonna end up that way or or that their case is that drastic. But um, that's what personality disordered people do. You know, they're, they're impulsive and they don't have much of a conscience. So those are outcomes that aren't unreasonable. So for people who are exiting um, relationships in which there has been violence, they can find out ways of documenting it in ways that would help prosecution in case um, something happens to them. And they can find that information through Susan's book called Time's Up, um, or um, it's even in an, a downloadable app form on the in the Apple Store, it's called IEAA. Uh, people can find out more information about it at documenttheabuse.com. Okay, and we'll have information about that also on our website. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or suggestions for people who are embroiled in litigation um, in a legal abuse scenario now or, or who may be in the future? Any words of wisdom, tips for helping them cope, anything like that? Um, well, first of all is they've got to get educated. It helps them to anticipate what's going to happen in court by understanding the nature of, of personality disorders. That you can learn to anticipate what, what's happening once you really understand the disorder. So there's more information about the disorders at saferelationshipsmagazine.com. Then understand how they act in court so that you can get your attorney up to speed. Um, being able to anticipate the same things. And there's information um, about how, how they act in court at billeddy.com. Um, and then lastly to know that there are a little bit of safeguards that, that people can get um, through the um, Americans with Disability Act, the ADA, which is called a court accommodation, especially for people who have PTSD, um, puts in place some, some safeguards in not having to have as much contact with the person who gave you PTSD in your law case in court. There, sometimes they allow you to film from other rooms or position yourself in court where you're not seeing and being triggered uh, by the person um, that you're in the court case with. So if people really do have PTSD or suspect they do and can get diagnosed, um, they can uh, find out how to do an ADA uh, uh, through Dr. Karen Huffer, H-U-F-F-E-R, who wrote the book, Legal Abuse Syndrome. Okay, great, thank you so much. That is really helpful. Um, is there anything else that you, that you wanna to add to what we've discussed already? Um, just that the, the experiences that people are having um, in which their symptoms are getting worse the longer their case goes on, um, that's very real. Just want to validate that, you know, for people that um, that's why Dr. Karen Huffer wrote about legal abuse syndrome, in which um, if you didn't have PTSD, you know, when you started this process, you end up looking having symptoms very similar to post-traumatic stress, you know, from um, legal abuse syndrome and and. and you know, the big thing is to understand what's happening to you, to try to safeguard, find an attorney that's willing to get educated on it and get um, get some uh, therapy support for yourself during the process. Right. Thank you so much, Sandra. We really appreciate your time today and your expertise. Thank you so much. 
Thank, thank you for having me. Thanks.